I just want to make sure that you all recognize that we have our speakers who did, did the TED Talks and our four MCs for the afternoon. So we've got them all there, and I, I had to do a little bit of um, persuasion on the MCs to get them to sit there. So they thought all the attention should go to the, to the, uh, to the speakers. All right, so I'm going to start with a, a question that came in and um, I think this question is to, to Ron Carucci. And this was a question about power. Um, and essentially the question is about how, um, pow how our presidents, because you spoke about proper power. And the question was uh, about presidents exerting proper power. And what would you say in terms of <laughs> Uh, yeah, this is a light one, but, but, yeah. That's a great way to start the evening. Um, yeah, so I think most of them don't. I think um, we, we easily confuse the exertion of power that comes with a position in an office with all kinds of other things, right? So personality might come to mind, or all kinds of other psychological diseases, narcissism. <laughs> but the essence of the use of power that comes with a position um, is it, defined by a set of rules, right? So whether you're a CEO in a company or you're head of a country or whatnot. Um, the difference between how you use your power and how aware you are of how, how others experience your power are two different things. We may have both problems, but I think it's important to recognize that power is in the perception of the experiencer, not the exerter of that power. And so it's very important to ask ourselves, not just are my good intentions being um, understood, but does my impact match those intentions? And I think w when you have such a significant and protracted gap between intent and impact, it doesn't matter how well you believe you're using your power, you're not. So I think I would encourage all people in, with large positions of power to find some way to, to get accurate feedback on how others are metabolizing what you're exerting. Thank you. So here's another question that came in through Glisser um, today, and I think this one would go to, to, uh, to Dottie. Dottie, you talked about uh, analogs in your, in your talk. Can, and so the question is, can analogs work with emotional or psychological situations that you want to test? And, and if so, did you see anything that was equivalent to that with the, with the underwater uh, experience you had? That is a very good question. I know that research has, has been done at universities to look at how, um, how they can work with uh, emotional and, and uh, psychological experiences through simulations, but I haven't seen it done with analogs, maybe because of the personal um, nature of that. Um, so that's a really interesting. From the, our standpoint, when we were at our analog, of course, we did have our flight doctors, and they were checking in both to see how we were responding to the time delay to see if that was frustrating at all. It really wasn't frustrating. 110 seconds is a lot like you texting with a friend, so that wasn't a big deal. But what could be frustrating to people is not having an immediate um, quick response with family members if something came up. For instance, we have had members of the space community while on orbit lose family members, um, witness 9-11 happening, and, and if the time delay becomes more and more significant beyond the 110 seconds, I could see there um, being a reason for um, being maybe more concerned about how the behavior, behavioral portion of that is. But for us, it wasn't, and so I think it's a great question. Maybe it's something that can be pursued further. Thank you. 
Okay, so I'm going to ask two more questions, and then I'm going to look to some of you. All right, so be thinking of a question you'd like to follow up on. So this question is to uh, Nick O'Neill. And Nick, what is the strangest kite you've ever seen or ever flown yourself? Uh, the strangest kite I've ever seen or flown myself? I would say the strangest kites um, that have really taken my breath away would actually be several of them together. Uh, I believe it was 13 65-foot long octopuses flying at one time. And it is completely breathtaking to see this fill the sky. Uh, at the same time, the, the most awe-inspiring kite that I've seen was uh, an indoor kite. Uh, it's very, very, very small and very lightweight. And from the heat coming off your hand, it can actually change the direction of the kite. It's that lightweight. Wow, thank you. So um, again, thank you to Glisser for uh, making this opportunity to, to capture some of these questions um, online. This was a question that uh, I think is to Kathy Coffee. And the question was, um, how does self-pity and the sense of victimization rob us of community? Whoa. Um, <laughs> how does self-pity and a sense of victimization rob us of community? Well, I would say that both self-pity and victimization are self-focused and that when we are looking internally at who we are or how our own experiences have affected our lives, that we rob ourselves of the ability to look outside ourselves and figure out how we can best join and connect with others. So Kathy, is that your final answer? <laughs> Do we have any questions from, the, from any of you on the floor? Would you prefer that I just bring over the mic, or would you, okay. Uh, Bill, Bill Burnett, I have a question about coming recently from corporate America many years. There's, there's a, a stigma of depression in corporate America. And can you speak to how this is being lifted as people make more of themselves uh, open and aware, because heretofore, something like that is a career stopper. Okay. That's better. Um, yeah, it used to be completely stigmatizing to the point where that people wouldn't, you couldn't be employed or people who ran their own businesses, everything they did was written off by others because, oh, that's just because you have ex, you know, such and such diagnosis. That still goes on to some extent, but it's becoming a lot more well known that a lot of people live with mental health conditions and it's becoming much more acceptable. But people still are putting themselves at risk a little bit by coming forward and saying, hey, I live with this, here's how I live with it. It's okay, people. <laughs> uh, you know, and it's um, so it's it's slow, and it's I think it depends on each person and their situation as to what kind of risk they're putting themselves at. For me, doing a TED talk about this is a little bit of a risk, not too much, because my current employer completely supportive. If I go out in the job market, you know, it shows as a marketing person, I think that I can message something positively, but it does concern me even there. But I don't mind because at some point you look at all the people who live with this and you're like, we gotta stop acting like we can't talk about it. So it is a thing and it's, it's getting smaller and let's maybe one day eradicate it. Another question from the field? 
Ron, I have a question for you about power. The anecdote that you told about the father and the son um, and encouraging us to try to gently nudge somebody's outlook in another direction. Um, I'm just aware of many potential pitfalls in people wanting to change other people's opinions, so I wanted to hear you talk a little more about that. Gosh, thank, thank you very much for that question. So I think you have to start, first start by understanding is your agenda to encourage and nudge or is it to convert, right? So I think if you have an agenda to convert, that's probably gonna backfire. Um, but offering a, a kind way to say maybe there's a different outlook without having to be attached to whether or not it works will go much better. I think if somebody, I, I loved the conversation between the two women from, I mean, I, I have a very good friend here. Who, he and I had had that, I mean, election night beyond. And I think if you know that somebody cares and I, I'm, I really am wanting to know and I'm really wanting you to benefit from a different way to see it, um, or I think you're hurting yourself by, by a narrow review and maybe not realize that, then my, my care will come across. If I have a need to be right and convert you, that's going to come across as well. So this question is for um, our youngest individuals up here. And uh, I'm... <laughs> Self-identified or, or not. <laughs> the, the, so I'm sure that all of you um, can, sh can share perhaps some of the, st the stress and panic that might have been part of preparing to provide talks like this today. So the question is, what was it that, that motivated you to actually take the challenge to step on the TEDx stage today or last year? <laughs> okay. Happy to help. Yeah. So I guess I'll start. So, do, having done research for um, quite a few years now, I've been able to contribute to this climate change problem or solution um, in my own way. Um, but through that, I've learned that me doing anything just by myself isn't going to actually change anything, and that we need everyone and the whole public support. And so doing this TED Talk was kind of my way of, you know, rallying my own team every, to, to show that, you know, everyone can actually contribute to this problem, and uh, just a stage for me to, um, to convey that message. Uh, part of TEDx and TED is the chance to spread an idea. And last year when I applied to speak, um, part of the reason was because as, um, as every generation sees, they face like a backlash from the generation before about like, you know, you're not doing things the right way. And part of my talk related to that very idea, it addressed how, you know, like necessarily, doing something a different way isn't necessarily wrong. And, um, Having the opportunity to speak at TEDx was a chance to have um, to approach a greater audience and um, people of all generations and be able to say uh, that that you know um, as a, as a millennial and as someone who uses social media frequently that doesn't necessarily make me you know that doesn't necessarily mean I'm doing something wrong or that I'm approaching things in a wrong way it's just I'm doing things differently and so is my generation. So that's why it was important for me to be a part of TEDx. I don't want to go. Um, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, well, in middle school, I used to think about myself mostly, you know. I was depressed and, you know, I was just thinking about how this was so hard for me and this is my struggle. But when I left middle school and I joined camp and I started volunteering, I saw that this is about all of us and how I could be focusing my energy into something more productive and I could be helping others who felt the same way as me. So I've been volunteering. I've made community service my life, my passion, my future because I don't want anyone to feel the way that I used to feel. 
I want people to see that there's someone there who is going to take a step and share her biggest secret and carry on the legacy of her own friend and not be afraid to cry on stage if she does. And I want to show people that everyone has courage. You just have to find it. And you and your friends can do that with you. So when I left that stage, I had so many people coming and hugging me. My phone is exploding with posts and notifications. <laughs> So the only way that I had courage was because of the support from my coach, Anna, from my friends, and even my dad, who left his business trip a day early just to come and watch my talk. Wow. <clears throat> wow, you really set the stage for me. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think what really motivated me to you know, be part of TEDx here is the, the, it's the, the process, really, that intrigued me. Um, they, they take you through this, you know, like Ted is, you know, about spreading ideas, right? And for me going in, my idea was, I had it, but it was kind of vague and convoluted, and I wanted to see how well I could refine it. And you can see that in the way these speakers present themselves. And that's sort of what motivated me to want to be a part of this, to you know, be able to effectively communicate an idea. That's for me. I'm going to ask Mark the question I know everybody wants to know. Did you get to deliver the concluding line? Uh, yes, I, I actually did remember. <laughs> uh, let's see, what was the line? It was. Leadership, leadership is more than thriving towards the heart of a group. It's about thriving toward the individual that thrives within. That was my line. So Riley is shaking his head, and so. I was hoping after being the adult table, but <laughs> um, when I was in high school, uh, well, I come from Marysville, and when I was in high school, I had I had a lot of friends, and I knew a lot of people that, that you know always said, "Oh, I want to be this, I want to be that, I want to do this, I want to do that," and most likely or, or most of the time, they would say it, but things happen, they don't end up doing it, and Ted, um, our school really used Ted and like just the whole visual media department for teaching education and. TED Talk was one that, that sacred, like, oh, man, you need to be up there if you want to be on a TED stage, you know? And, and I just saw all this, like, just self-pity, you know, and, and just thinking that they can't do it. So I chose to go for TED um, as an example to prove to other people that, you know, you don't have to just, um, you know, just be defeated by this invisible wall. You can say, hey, I can do whatever I want. So by me doing that, I, and I, I hope I inspired a lot of people to, to chase what they want to do, too. Great. So I think we just have time for maybe two or three more questions, and uh, this one is for Farmer Frog. So the question is, what is there about putting your hands in the dirt and, and um, helping something grow that seems to affect children in a positive way? That's a very deep question. And I think that all of us can actually relate to that because we are all children at heart. It's um, being part of something that is alive and grows, grows through cycles, maybe even um, sometimes failures because not all plants make it. Uh, sometimes you have a squirrel that comes through and really helps you out in gardening. <laughs> and so um, working with life provides you with unpredictable outcomes and yet enables you to be part of that game. And um, I think it teaches kids that, um, yes, they are all powerful, for one, 
but they are also a humble part of it. And that is something that we all could build on. Because I think if we all realize that in our interactions with each other and the environment, we would have a classroom full of kindergartners cheering, just like they do, and a very peaceful day, pretty much every day. And I think that's, that's it. I think we can learn most, actually, from children. It's not really children learning in the garden. I learned so much just watching them. So I highly recommend it to everybody. So I want to give Tom a chance to know that this one's coming, this ball is a change up and is coming at you. Okay. Um, so Tom, what is the difference between behavioral health and mental health? And is it just the same word, like spelled backwards or, or what? It's such a great question. Um, Currently, uh, when we describe behavioral health, what we're really talking about is uh, mental health and addiction treatment. And those have been so separated, uh, and very falsely so, because so many people experience both those things together. And so it's not the best phrase, you know, but I think we've struggled to find a descriptive phrase uh, that really encaptures and well describes um, the importance of that work and the issues uh, that folks that face those challenges do. So I agree it's not the greatest phrase, but currently in our nomenclature, uh, that's what we mean when we talk about behavioral health. Okay, so one last question, and this one's of the entire group, everyone who's there up, up before us. And so I'm going to ask you, um, we're going to start with Marcy, so get ready. Dr. Larson, this, um, so I'm looking for two words. Two words that describe um, what you were feeling before you went on stage and what you were feeling after you came off stage for the last time today. One word for each. Yes. So going on stage, going on stage one and word coming for off. how I felt going on stage, one word coming, coming off. Yes. Um, so yeah. everyone listen very carefully okay. to the word she uses because she's going to set the bar. Okay, yeah. going on stage, butterflies. Coming off stage, calm. Which I think is pretty standard. <laughs> uh, before stage, excited. Uh, after stage, also excited. <laughs> Before stage, uh, anticipation, and afterwards, uh, it's relief. Uh, it's not one word, but before stage, should have gone to the bathroom. <laughs> After stage, relief. <laughs> Um, before a stage, uh, meditative, and after, hyper. <laughs> uh, before stage, anxious, after stage, excited. Uh, before stage, uh, it's a hyphenated word, hopeful terror, <laughs> and afterwards, terror. relieved. <laughs> Before stage, um, anticipation, and after stage, elation. Focused and thankful. Um, wobbly and then steady. <laughs> Focused and connected. Responsibility and gratitude. Disbelief and disbelief. <laughs> um, we'll say calm and then really hungry. <laughs> I would say worried and relieved. <laughs> How is he calm? <laughs> 
Would you give all of these precious individuals a hand? I just want to take the opportunity again to um, thank each of them for all that they invested in delivering such a wonderful day for us, a day of ideas, of information, and a day of imagination shared with us. I want to thank uh, Dr. Larson and the Mukilteo School District for making this facility available to us, and all of, all of the staff. I want to thank, um, I just, I really want to thank all of the team members for TEDx again. And I want to thank all of you. And we appreciate your support for Snow Owl Libraries and for this, for this effort of sharing and spreading ideas. We are community together. We are community together. So I want to just let all of you know up here that there are some there are some light bulb moments with flowers stuck in them over there for you to take home with you. We can't thank you enough for all that you've done. Good night, everyone. Have a great rest of the weekend. <laughs>